Daniel Zaruba, how are you doing, my good man? You doing all right today? I'm doing very good. I just did a stroll for like an hour or so in the dark and nice. it's very cold here. So I feel very refreshed and thrilled to talk with you. I, well, I am thrilled as well. Well, that, you know, I hear about all these different people, this craze of starting cold showers in order to get energized in the morning. It's apparently healthy for you or, or whatever. So the idea of taking a stroll uh, in the cold is a wonderful idea. I spent my childhood walking in the woods, so uh, through the mountains and getting lost. Uh, so that that's a wonderful way to start the day. Well, Zaruba, you are a master of Japanese philosophy, Japanese thinking. I've enjoyed all your talks with um, Johannes, all the talks I've obviously had the joy of getting to share with you. Um, your Viveki conversation on religion and nothingness. I think it's a underappreciated realm of thought. Um, and the, the culture as a whole and the arts and all these things are just fascinating. And I actually think very important for the West to get a better hold on and to understand and to look into. Um, so, and you visited Japan, is that is that correct? Yeah, I've, I've not just visited Japan. I've also studied there for a year. Wow. Um, at the university in Kyoto. And yeah, this was just a great experience um, overall. Although, right, I, and we will certainly talk about this, right? Um, I, I was kind of like romanticizing Japan before this, mm. and then I, I didn't do that <laughs> any longer. <laughs> but still, I was more realistic then about the whole thing. But I've also seen, right, how, how our, right, how globalization makes our cultures kind of like more and more similar. Mm. We are all entrenched kind of like in the same cultural logic more and more. Mm. Um, but we don't, we, don't, we don't recognize the dangers of this. We're kind of like, we are unaware, we're just participating in this logic without kind of like questioning it in, in a deeper sense. And that, that um, harbors a real, real danger um, that we... we should talk about more often i think oh yeah I, well absolutely there is this tendency of globalization to make places all very similar uh you know like uh, you see it in america here where you go from gretna to bedford they all have the same sort um assortment of walmart target mm. uh mcdonald's and so on and where the um like rustford used to have a little diner called huds and then the Hardys moved in and everything changed, right? There's, and it's kind of all the little shops go out the wood, and there's this kind of flattening effect, which then increases, you know, the costs come down maybe and uh, efficiency, but the individual characteristics of the town can sort of be, be uh, can be removed. Um, well, I'm very curious, well, you lived in Japan, my goodness, uh, for a year in Japan. What, you know, you mentioned on coming a more realistic view of Japan, sort of from an idealist. And I think we all have that tendency to only think of the good stuff of a place before we visit it. And then we go and we're like, ah, maybe not so much. Uh, you know, maybe it's not, not quite what you think. What would be some of the ideas that um, were not necessarily deconstructed, but were made more realistic or refined that you had about Japan? Yeah, kind of like, um, right, when you, when you encounter Japanese arts, like even even today, right? I, I prefer some of the, the popular culture much more to like Western popular culture. Mm. Um, then you think, oh, that, that this is really there's still some meaning in 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 even in the pop popular culture, where kind of like in our culture, often like meaning is um, oh now what dissipating <laughs> mm. and and fading away, <laughs> but right then then when you when you come there right there is this i mean right the the, the working culture is much more extreme in, in e not just in japan in east asia in general than than compared to the west and there are just so many things i could talk about from a socioeconomic perspective that are really horrifying when you right. when you think about them um and there is this, again, there is this, what is also in the West, right? There's this heat when you, when you go into a city, you, you're at right, Tokyo, so it's so vibrant. And mm -hmm. there are so many, right, images floating and people and noises. And it's just, it's just overwhelming, not just mm -hmm. for the senses. And um, yeah, and of there's, there's, there's things like right, suicides, for example. Um, in Japan, it's in Tokyo, it's normal when they have like I don't know when a when a train doesn't 
I don't know, work for two hours or so. Every, every, doesn't, it's not spelled out, it's not said, but everyone knows, okay, then someone jumped in the right. in front of the train. And people there aren't even, they aren't even bothered by this. They're not, they're not shocked by it. They just, mm. they, they just, yeah, okay, that's what happened in here. And it's, it's normal. And that, for example, really shocked me, right? This is, it's, it's even, some, some even complain, they would say, yeah, can't this person kill itself somewhere else? <laughs> don't, don't bother us here in the, in the traffic. Like, uh, it's very, very strange, very weird when you encounter it. Oh, no, well, you have these collapsing birth rates. You've had an economic um, lost decade since, I guess, 91. You know, there's exactly. no birth wage. I think, doesn't Japan have like 70 towns? I don't, I'm not, they have a, like 70 or so small villages where everyone is at least 75 years old. Like it's like these incredible age yeah. disparities. So, so that, that's one thing. They have, they have, I think, the, the highest percentage of what I think is called super centenarians. Yep. So like people over 100, um, which is like, which is a good thing, right? Um, they, they have, they have a very healthy, yep. um, aged population which is however negative side many of them are forced to work right so that's not that's not an option for them they have often right you think oh they they, they want to work still in, in when they have retired but some have to so that's also um, one thing then we have this phenomenon right of ka karoshi which means right the, this overwork until you you are dead um um, so that sometimes happens in, especially in, in some of the big companies, which kind of like still keep the traditional culture very alive. This kind of like pre-bubble, um, hyper-productive um, working culture, um, which it, right, which is of course not really healthy. You have a student loan crisis. I've just seen a video like a few days ago that um, where um, an expert said. Um, Again, pre-bubble, like universities were just pl places of partying and leisure. And today he said um, they are working poor palaces. Mm. Almost like they have a very high rate of, of um, university students in general. But many students have, they have to go to university, similar to in America. They just, yeah, if you don't go to college, good luck finding a job. Um, and that comes then with the problem that many students have to to work every single day in like a restaurant or so and that then causes that they don't have time for actual studying which then make, makes the the higher education quite low in in um quality standard mm -hmm. and that's something that we we when i was in japan we've all uh, kind of like observed this like the, the 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 level of the classes was rather low compared to in in many many fields compared to um let's say to to western universities um i think this is this changes then in graduate schools and and so forth but they also have just a sh huge number of universities in general and where you just pay a lot but it's not really you just you're there for three or four years but it's not really like high standard mm. um and those student loans then um are burdening young people and they many of them really postpone or don't even consider having a family marrying um having having children mm. um so that phenomenon is called bankonka um, is delayed marriage Hmm. And the marriage is very delayed. It's almost um, now post 30 for many people. Hmm. And in Japan, it's also a problem. Unless if, if you're not married, they, they don't get usually children. So extramarital childbirth is something, is a kind of like cultural taboo still. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of like then reduces the, the child, the rate of childbirth. And then creates like, this huge gap, which you um, mentioned before, between you have, a, you have a very large population of people who are, who are over 60, and you, you have a smaller and smaller and smaller population when, when you go down. Um, and of course, this, this will, uh, not in a few decades, this will then amount in a kind of like demographic catastrophe. 
mm. when a few like it's just a very um, a large core a large cohort of old people and you have a small cohort of young people of course this will cause a catastrophe right um you have a loneliness epidemic yeah <laughs> i mean <clears throat> i mean this is really a huge problem and then at the, you've maybe heard of the hikikomori phenomenon this kind of um those social recluses where people don't don't decide to not participate in society anymore and they just shut themselves into the the room of their parents parents then often might they pay them and give them food or so um but they they don't see any value in participating in society mm. going to work participating in this right very very um harsh also um, socioeconomic reality and the reality of work life in japan mm. um yeah that that crisis that's not just for young people or for for individuals but also for the state mm. right you know japan has one of the um, largest um state debts but it's it's all accumulated within japan that's why it's often not appearing in in some statistics kind of like international statistics right. And they they just give out they just give out money for even now in the pandemic they had, don't have tourists now for almost two years because like they they have closed the borders and not really opened them up and now they're giving like just um, um, vouchers or checks for like um, traveling or going out into restaurants and kind of like they're really doing a lot of government spending there um, huh. which is right then also just um, making the the what the the how the financial household to um yeah expanding housing is also just a huge problem in the tokyo area you can't it, it's very hard for, for like a family to, to afford like like housing that is maybe also close to the city and then what happens is just that this this huge um area at tokyo like this is just Right. It has, I don't know, almost 40 million people. And many people spend, I don't know, two, three, four hours just in traffic each day. And of course, that is also then um, reducing um, um, like happiness or life, life satisfaction. Or so. No, no, I'm done. For, for... No, that was an excellent overview. Um, What's so fascinating about Japan is precisely that I think many people in the West have this kind of romantic view of it. You know, they see maybe some of the uh, Akira, Akira Kawasaki movies or some of the cherry blossom tree images or the extraordinary music of a Joe Hizashi or a Yoko Kano or um, Raikou Sinsuko, I think, who did, um, who's an extraordinary composer. And there's this, and there's also, of course, the um, bias of the, uh, of the different, you know, it's Eastern as opposed to Western. And, and that is so powerful. And, and yet that um, is occurring as you have this incredibly difficult socioeconomic um, reality. You know, every, you know, most people in the West, uh, America, Europe too, would probably be familiar with some of the Studio Ghibli films like My Neighbor Tortoto, Spirited Away, different things, you know. I, I think if one, uh, I'm not a professional critic, but if one compare, compares something like um, Ponyo with uh, a Disney film, uh, just pick one, uh, the Disney film is pitiful in comparison with the whole package of the story, of the music, of the, uh, it's just not even close in my view. Uh, people to this day, uh, who saw in my generation, who saw my neighbor Toto to when they were a kid or something like that, still will hear the, you know, the wind tunnel music from Joe Hizashi and tear up because it's so extraordinarily powerful to them. They may, they may smile when they hear music from Beauty and the Beast or something like that, uh, or, but, but, but the, the impacts that some of these Japanese films have had on people, the animated films, um, are, are stunning. And even when you get to Akira Kawasaki, um, My Secret Fortress, um, Seven Samurai, you know, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg would say that those were the most extraordinary um, influence. I think in the first Star Wars movie, there's even an allusion to the Secret Fortress um, movie and different things. So what's so fascinating to me is why, why in the world do you get such extraordinary storytelling uh, music and art, because I think that is generally speaking, and I'd be curious what you think about it, what leads to a lot of the idealism, you know, a lot of, you know, that a lot of people in the West will see. And, and why exactly does that emerge 
out of a Japanese culture. Uh, because also too, I think a lot of the popularity of um, Japanese art, and I know it's wider than what I've mentioned, really took off in after the 90s. Uh, and and I, I think a lot of Japan's socioeconomic problems really started to take off after 1991. Uh, you know, there, I mean, don't get me wrong, there's there's still some classics in the 80s there. And there would be, it'd be curious to talk about how losing World War II affects the psyches of the Japanese people in different things. But, um, but 1991 is when it starts to take off. And what's so interesting is the, I think the most popular films in in regard to box office in Japan are mostly the Studio Ghibli films. I think there's Your Name and some of the other, but they're mostly these anime movies, a lot of them. Um, and they're happy. You know, generally speaking, they're not, they're, they're pretty happy. Whereas in the West, uh, all the Oscar films are freaking depressing. <laughs> you know, the Oscar films, very often the Oscar winning films are existential in the West. They're kind of sad and they're kind of miserable. They're talking about how bad life is. All the popular shows are like, have some kind of betrayal and you can't trust people in different things. And I just find that really interesting because arguably, I'm not saying that the West is all um, um, happy-go-lucky, obviously, but I, I think it would be hard to argue that Japan is not in a worse socioeconomic situation than the West, at least from a cultural standpoint. Now, funny enough, it seems like the West might be accelerating in the direction of Japan, and uh, but but it's just interesting to me that 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 disconnect. Do you have any thoughts on that? Have you noticed a similar thing? I'm just not to force you in a certain direction of thought, but I always just find that kind of mismatch really interesting. Maybe to your first question, why, why Japan had this extraordinary artistic outburst in the 20th century or even now, right? Yes. Um, I think, I think, right, we, we have to really go back, right, um, to the Meiji Restoration, right? Um, Japan was the, was the, the first country that kind of like um, achieved to come um, toe and toe with the, the, the Western forces. Mm. Um, they pay the price for this, right? This, they, they kind of like, right, there, there were those famous missions that kind of like sent scholars and politicians to like Europe and said, okay, we want to build a modern state, kind of like a modern industrial state. And now we just look, wh where do we get from? We, we do this really like, we do this like engineers, right? And they got the constitution, for example, from Prussia. They got like the railway system and the, the traffic system from England. Mm. And they got then some, some cuisine from, from France or so. And they really, they really went all over Europe and, and looked, okay, here, that is good. And we take this school system also from Prussia, for example. So they re remodeled the schools, like the Prussian schools back then. Um, and then they, they really constructed a modern state, so to say. And that... But that, right, that was such a radical transformation. For example, many people then um, went from those very um, local, rural, multi-generational households to, let's say, nuclear family type, um, mm -hmm. um, right, um, kind yeah. of like this, this um, schism between the family. Um, more, they, they were more pursuing, right, following the job, so to say, in the city and not staying with the family um, from where they grew up. Um, and then right then, then you have to, has had, and you had this explosion in those um, centers like I don't know, Osaka and Tokyo and, and maybe the other industrial centers. And, then, um, and that really led to like a Nishitani, I'll just mention this, right? If you're mm. interested, someone who's watching this, this is right, the self-overcoming of nihilism. Mm. And in there at the end is a, a, a kind of like an appendix called the meaning of nihilism for Japan. And there Nishitani kind of like states this kind of like, they took all of this in, but they weren't, they weren't afraid of, they, they couldn't feel and couldn't know the kind of like, um, massive anxiety that people like um, Nietzsche or Kierkegaard or, or um, Dostoevsky had. They, they couldn't, right? They, they didn't. They were just taking in 
the kind of like Europeanization without being aware of this, right, this whole collapse of that, that of the, the kind of like the, the understructures oh. that that were going on at the same time. And thus, Nishitani writes, um, the crisis wasn't felt as a crisis. They were kind of like blind. They were, they were, they, oh. they couldn't, they couldn't feel it, what was going on. And then there was this isolation to, let's say, the traditional um, religious structures like Confucianism or Buddhism and so forth. Um, and this is, this is also something I wanted to mention. Um, there is religiosity. Religion is a kind of taboo, which is right, which we would say this is, this is like a fountain for meaning cultivation. That's a kind of taboo topic for most Japanese people. They practice religion, but it is a kind of, again, it's a kind of taboo topic. It's more this, it's more maybe this, maybe, maybe I, I've heard this from a friend like a few months ago. Now, like Zen is becoming more attractive again because a lot of people, again, also feel this kind of like disconnectedness, what we call in the West, the meaning crisis. Mm. Um, but in general, religion, especially like doctrine centered religion, like we think of it in the West, right? You have doctrines, you have kind of you have institutions, and, and then you especially right fundamentalism. That is really a taboo topic because um, right in the 90s there was this um, this gassing in the in the in the subways in Tokyo. Right. This is this um, with with Sarina, like with and this was from a religious sect, like the um, Shinkyo sect, and. There are many of those sects in Japan, unfortunately, kind of like, kind of like, like they are in, in, right in the US, you also have all sorts of denominations and right. like, um, so that's, that's one thing. And then, um, right. Many, this is, this is one argument, what you said, but this is one argument that has often been made kind of like, why was it just initially, right? Why was it just the Japanese people that could um, take in and creatively appropriate, let's say, Western styles of, of art, like music, like um, literature, um, like film and so forth. And this is like a more 20th century argument that th this was because right then the Japanese, right, they, they were the first who successfully um, stood toe-on-toe -to -toe with Western powers. And this is also often unknown. Japan was the first country that actually um, fought a war against the Western nation and won. This was against Russia in I think, 1905. Mm. So that there was a, a Japanese-Russian um, war. Um, right. And then there are all sorts of right, more nationalistic arguments that say, okay, Japan is somehow better than the other nations. I would not, I would not, um, I would not argue in that direction because that's more chauvinistic, I guess. Um, it's more 20th century. Um, but it's, I would, I would say it's because um, Japan has just most successfully um, accustomed itself to the West and to the European edition of the world. And they just did it the best. And then, and of course, right, you can also work with those art forms that, that come from there. Yeah, when, you have the, when you have the time to, I don't know, educate some brilliant people who can really do this. Um, you know, you said so many wonderful things just now, and I have this, I mean, so <clears throat> it's really fascinating to think that Japan, through the quote-unquote mission, absorbed a lot of Western ideas, Western ways of doing things, but in not having, say, the way the West has done religion or some of the kind of ideas of how sources of meaning that the West would get, that when Japan absorbed them, then they really quickly got the negatives of those Western ways of doing things. Whereas here in America, we've, we've almost had 
I'll guess I'll call it modernism to be very general. We've had modernism longer, but since we've had these Western sources of meaning, the breakdown of modernity into post-modernity and then now meta-modernity has been slower, where there's almost a funny thing where Japan has accelerated straight to what they call meta-modernity, where they went really quick through post-modernity into meta-modernity. And it's almost like Japan is ahead of the West even though they absorbed some of the Western thinking later because they didn't have this slow slowing down of the negative the acids of modernity that the west had and that now the west is losing faith in and having that that same sort of meaning crisis um i find that a really interesting framing because in meta modernity um as i understand it you know there's always a new modernity you know modernity post modernity everything you know you had modernity where is these questioning questioning of you know um well fragmentation of people's understanding of the world you know science destroys religion or you know these losses of sources of meaning then post modernity being more of examining power structures like foucault also going to be talking about more self awareness irony and different things where meta modernity wants to say okay we're going to take seriously what we learned from modernity and post modernity but we're also are going to take meaning very seriously and critically meta modernity um which tends to be accompanied by a decaying socioeconomic order really really emphasizes the arts the arts are a unique place to find meaning because if you don't really have religion so much or you don't have the same kind of religion maybe you have spirituality but frankly spirit spirituality versus religion um is yet to pass the test of history as being as equally effective as creating community and and direction and different things that doesn't mean it can't i'm not saying that but we have a longer track record of of um religion probably because religion um maybe by force is better at creating community where spiritualization can be more fragmentary because you have your own spiritual connection with god that's a that's a different topic i don't have a strong stance on that but that's just something that comes to mind um but but any culture that goes into a meta modernal direction which arguably Japan has been in the longest uh in the west is starting to come in is actually going to be really concerned with the arts like really concerned with the arts because that's going to be the main source of meaning and also critically you've kind of learned that if humanity doesn't have meaning stuff gets really bad like it gets it gets really really dark and so you become much more concerned about the quality of your arts and um and and what they're about like i find it fascinating you know a lot of you know you take something like a violet evergarden or something like that right you know some people say oh it's there's some mellow melodramatic right there's a lot of crying there's a lot of these sort of magical moments man it's apparent they don't even care like in the west if you were to do something that risked looking like melodramatic you get laughed off the stage but in the, a lot of these more animated programs you'll see a lot more um or the the movie the departed with the cello writer you know these scenes that are really going for powerful emotion um why is it that they're okay with doing that where in the west it's almost like we're starting to those. get those i love the <laughs> oh yeah they're amazing um, there is there is um i watched it while at ever garden of course and i also watched departures of course um, outstanding um who who made this who's it i don't know I think Murakami, right? Murakami Haruki. I think mm. he said, and was it someone else? I don't know. They said, right? I mean, this is, of course, this is more twentieth century. Um, take it, take it with a grain of right, sure. grain. Um, to kind of like the Japanese soul is more melancholic. Mm. Kind of, it, it is just, it is just like that. Um, we watched right we, in the in the Harkyun Guild. We watched uh, a documentary. Um, that's um, Lou. You know Lou. Talk yes. Lou. Um, he 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 um, suggested this. It was a documentary about Greek tragedy, and in there there was a quite long segment that compared kind of like Greek this kind of like Greek tragedy with the kind of like Japanese affinity for tragedy. And that a lot of Japanese writers had like they loved Greek tragedy or tragedy in, in as such. Mm. So we don't we don't have to make every, everything I don't know kind of like superficially happy, but we can we can actually produce real like tragic melodramatic yes. um, um, pieces of, of of stories and films, and it's non ideological. And this is something very right refreshing to see in, in a time where in, in the West everything's politicized and everything's ideolog ideologized. Um, and there's really there's really, this is really absent in, in Japan. 
I don't, Absolutely. I don't, I don't really see this in um, even even right like social justice issues. This mm. kind of like all this this stuff that's very big now in the West is, is like is not not really a thing. It's it's becoming more and more a thing for more and more people. And I think when you when you want to address socioeconomic issues, um, that's often like many many people just they talk more about socioeconomic issues because mm -hmm. it's so it's just so hard as a reality for most people um especially right young women when they don't marry when when young people decide okay we don't make families then of course it's very hard as as an individual person right to um especially then when you have um wage gaps between let's say men and women um so that's certainly an issue but like so this whole cultural dimension is so weird uh, in, in our in our time now um that's rather absent in in japan or I would say they did have, they did this healthier, right? Um, there is they they always played even in art. There are some art forms where they played, for example, with with gender or so, and yeah. so they don't have to. They kind of like they don't. They they say okay, this 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 has its place in the arts. Do you know? Do you know, for example, Takarazuka? Yes. Um, oh, really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a musical group in in the city of Takarazuka mm -hmm. in, in near Osaka, and there, for example, you have also um, right females who sing male roles, yeah. and this is like one famous famous um, famous example for um, where you where can play with gender in the realm of arts, and you don't have to force it, kind of like as in the West, where all of the discussion is so weird and and and. and um, straining right. um so but in general again you, you you made this point right the the art is is melodramatic it really addresses often the human condition it addresses um it address it, it is tragic oftentimes and it 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 achieves this by being non-ideological yes and and non-moral like right this kind of like moralism that's so pervasive in our times also um, is also absent in. in well, all of that moralization, all that stuff greatly gets in the way of good art. It's very difficult to have great art if you have all of those parts in play. And what's fascinating to me is like, say, in some of the scenes of Violet Evergarden, which I just think is unbelievably extraordinary, they don't, there's this interesting issue in a lot of Japanese um, art where. And I feel like in the West, you wouldn't go for these kind of stories because you'd be afraid of being seen as melodramatic or romantic. Whereas in Japan, they're like, no, nah, we're gonna do it. And, and, it, and they earn it because the way they do the story, it's not what's called poured in the top from creative writing. It's built up and it's incre incredibly powerful. What I find really interesting, it's almost as when the pressures of meta-modernity get worse and worse and all you have is art, then you swallow, it's almost like you swallow your pride a little bit and you say, no, 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 we need beauty. We need extraordinary stories that restore hope in life. Uh, and we're going to do it. And we don't care if people view us. We, we don't care, you know, as a 40 year old man, you're going to go and watch um, Howl's Moving Castle or something like that because the work life pressures are so terrible. You need that vision of beauty and goodness. And you can't afford for art in your culture to be ideological or to be lame or silly. And you can't afford for the politics to come in and consume your art. Like you were mentioning gender fluidity, Japanese, uh, some of the novels, uh, you know, obviously you see in like a Tokyo Godfather, different things, there are gender fluid characters, but it's not a political issue. It's like, these are people who exist in the world and they're, and they're part of it and, and they keep going um, because political messaging is always a threat to art. That doesn't mean art can't have political consequences, but it, it cannot be poured in from the top. You know, it has to be earned in the story, in the, in the plot and different things like that. Well, if you're really feeling the pressures of not having meaning and art and I think in meta-modernity, art gets this huge role. You just simply cannot afford for your art to not be as outstanding as possible. Um, and there's something that I think you see playing in the Japanese. The other thing I wanted to add um, that I find really interesting, um, you know, obviously we mentioned animation. You know, there's a lot of the video game, you know, the anime and different things like that. You know, why is it in Japan? Like in the West, there could be a feeling of, oh, that's for kids. That is childish. You know, that is not something that an adult would watch. And arguably, there are very, very few um, adult uh, 
cartoons in the West, maybe like The Simpsons or Family Guy or Bojack, um, but they're all comedies, right? They're not like serious. You're only now starting to get serious adult animation, like something like an Invincible I see on Amazon or these different things, but Castlevania on Netflix, or different things. but really animated programs that were for adults, not for children and adults, like a Pixar film, like Wally or something. Adults can enjoy Wally, but but like literally um, something like Ghost in the Shell is not for kids at all. It's completely for adults. You don't really see anything like that in the West until starting now, which is interesting because it's almost like now, because the horrors of metamodernity and the pressures are there, it's almost like, we okay, we're just going to swallow our pride and say we're adults and don't do this because we need really, really good art and we re need really good story to have meaning. And we're just going to swallow our pride and we don't care if it's animated or not. Because I wanted to know, um, video games, animation, they have a very unique advantage in the kind of stories they can tell. Like take something like Violet F. Garden or Ghost in the, let's take Ghost in the Shell, you know, the cyborg, you know, all that different stuff. A li the live action version of Ghost in the Shell with uh, Scarlett Johansson is terrible. It is not good at all because Ghost in the Shell in live action is bad. You know, it's just not, you, a lot of the, when you don't have to make your story manifest into the real world, there is so much more you can do and so much better stories you can tell. There's something about live action that is actually handicapping. It like handicaps you because you're you're very limited. Like if you take Attack on Titan and you have the Titans in live action, they would they look horrible. It's mm. stupid. But when you no. do it in animation, arguably Attack on Titan is one of the most extraordinary plot lines that have ever existed in the world. But if you're only allowed to have live action, that story becomes impossible. You really cannot tell that story outside of an animated structure. Well, that would mean because I really do think that a lot of like Ghost and Shell do these different things. If you were behind a Rawlsian veil of ignorance and you did not know these movies were animated, or the music of Yoko Kano was associated with a Cowboy Bebop and all these different things, if you did not know her music was associated with anime and you just heard it, um, you would go, that's some of the greatest music in the world. And you wouldn't have this bias as a Westerner to go, oh, that's just for kids, right? If you were behind a veil of ignorance, it's like this kind of Western thing of seeing it as childish that makes you not objective. I, I think it is very difficult to argue that, say, um, the, the the some of the from Wolf um, Wolf Rain of Yoko Kano, like the Requiem piece, like that 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 does not belong above the works of John Williams or whatever. But it's just that John Williams, uh, not just I'm not saying that it's bad. The Star Wars and the Indiana Jones are different things, but you got freaking Yoko Kano going from jazz to classical, the Escaflot. Like it's just kind of. It makes your head blow up, like the kind of way that she moves between all these different forms. She's, I would say she's the world's greatest composer. That's my view. Uh, I would fight for that because I've never seen anyone who is able to move between all of these different types of music and create some of the most extraordinary works on planet Earth. But because it's not like, you know, a European concert hall where you're doing Bach or whatever, there's a bias against it. But I really do think if you were to be behind a, a Rawlsian veil of ignorance, and you were able to be objective, you go, yes, he belongs at the, the top of the of the of the of the um the hierarchy. So this is all to say, um, as the pressures of metamodernity and the suck of life that happens when you lose meaning get great and great, greater and greater, then you you cannot let your pride get in the way of the quality of your story. You cannot let your pride get in the way of the quality of your music. So you go to animation because animation allows certain adult stories like Ghost in the Shell, Akira, so on, that are literally not possible in live action in a way that doesn't look horrible or that has the same effect. And if art becomes the main source of meaning in your life, basically, you, you can't have any handicaps. You got to use every tool at your disposal as you've got. And you're going to do that. And you're, and you're not going to, and, and also too, you can no longer be afraid of seeming melodramatic or seeming childish or whatever, because you can't, you can't waste your time anymore. You have got to figure out how to have art being as good as possible to provide you with a sense of something to live for as the crushing pressures of globalization and capitalism weigh down upon you. That seems to be happening in Japan. Um, and I, I mention all this too, because I, I find it really interesting that the number of adult animations that kind of are existing in America has increased significantly as the socioeconomic situation has gotten worse. Um, and, and that more and more people are willing to do it. And you just see there's some dialectical tension there that's really, really fascinating. And it just, to me, um, 
as meta modernity, and then I'll pass it back to you, as meta modernity gets worse, which, you know, is where you realize you have to have meaning, but you have these pressures of the collapsing family or different things, then you just swallow your pride and you say, we need the best possible stories. And there are certain stories that anime or video games like Final Fantasy VI or whatever that can provide that we need, like we desperately need in order to keep going. Or you need some, you know, this can get into, we've talked with Nishashani, like religion, this new suchness and getting out of platonic thing. But that's a different discussion we've had at different times, which of course we can bring in. But I think I'm just very interested in, oh, and I also, before I forget, the creation of music in your society is also relative to the presence of story. Like, you know, if you say St. Uh, Saint John's Passion, St. Saint Matthew's Bach and all this, the stories of the Bible or different things like that. I don't think it's by chance that the best music often is associated with like the best anime stories, because why in the world would you ever come up with, say, some of the tracks in Wolf Rain unless you were coming up with them for the story of Wolf Rain or Cowboy Bebop or different things like or some of the Ghost in the Shell inner universe or different things like story gives you reason to create certain music that. Without that story, you would never make that music, you see? And so a society that doesn't have the same handicaps on the stories that it can make because it's willing to explore different mediums will also generate unique music. And that's why like people like in this, all, everything I've said also applies to some of the video games like a Chrono Trigger or a Final Fantasy or whatever. Like people like in the West, they'll, they will like, <laughs> like, like to get into a distance world concert, you know, all the Final Fantasy music, Man, you gotta order those tickets like freaking five months in advance. People will kill you to get those tickets or whatever. Like they have a deep emotional connection with that music. Like that you just that's really extraordinary. That gets tied to the unique story of the different of the different things that then has a nostalgic impact on them and that is deeply, deeply meaningful for them. Um, and so it's interesting how I think all those play together because I've always just been fascinated by why is it that Jap Japan, exactly what you say, like Japan is miserable <laughs> it's like it's not there's a lot of misery there i'm not i'm not generalizing i mean as you get out of the cities it seems like it can get a little better it just depends um arguably that's most civilization but i'm biased i live on a farm uh so but it's just interesting that you have this extraordinary um renaissance basically it seems to me like a story and music renaissance that comes out of japan that i think sometimes in the west we're blind to acknowledging because of our bias in favor of live action like basically if it's not live action it's not real it almost has to become live action and then we'll take it seriously so that blinds us from the quality of the work coming out of which in meta modernity you you require the highest quality work possible in order to survive um, and, and so you're not, so you're going to swallow your pride and say, yeah, we're going to use animation because we just simply can't limit, uh, the horizon of our possibilities if we're going to, um, if we're going to pull through this. <laughs> this was, this was great. Just listening to it. Oh uh, um, just your, right. Your, um, <laughs> uh, what, what is a good word for this? Um, and enth enthusiasm, right. It's so, <laughs> so, 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 so lovely. Right. And, and I, I rather, I, I share it to, to hundred percent. Roger Ebert, a great critic, right. The great mm. film critic said about, um, grave of the fireflies. Oh it's such an, it's such an emotional, um, it, this film has such an emotional impact that it. It makes you want to rethink the, the the value of animation in general. I think this was something you you pointed to. So like, there is there is something about this medium of of animated film that that just creates an impact that, as you said, right, a, a live action piece just cannot deliver. It yeah. just can't, um, and. Right, there are talking now about Grave of the Fireflies. There are, of course, right. Um, we right the whole the whole post-war generations, right, and those who who were um, um affected by war, of course, had to deal with the of the, and they had to kind of like right, transmute it somehow. And I think, think right with, with art, art is one of the best ways to trans transmute um, um despair or or. Um, that whole, that whole, um, right, with the nuclear bombs and oh yeah, like, I mean, I mean, Japan also created a lot of harm, obviously, um, but they also, of course, suffered a lot of um, problems. Um, then you have right, you mentioned Ghost in the Shell and so forth. So then you had the bubble crisis and this kind of like right, this this rise of those mega cities yeah. and this kind of like right, suddenly 
after the bubble that was really this was really this kind of like doomer mindset and this kind of like red dystopian mindset right, right? and now you really had a lot of people um um feeling um, falling let's say into what we today call this meaning crisis yeah. and partly much earlier again than like like in the early 2000s because in, in japan they, they had a lot of handheld consoles and and technology was just much more available than with what came in later with the smartphones for the West. Um, and there are some great pieces of, of literature. I, I like, this is, she's called Kanehara Hitomi, um, the female, female writer. She's not, she's, I don't know, she's 38 now. So she's quite young. She, she got one of the most important literature prizes at a very young age. Mm. Um, and this is this is just she she had a protagonist there, um, just a young woman who desperately tries to find meaning, and can't. And and she just right she she's in the subculture. She's interested in I don't know, um, body modification and and um, very rough um, sex and so forth, it, and and tries to right, find meaning and create meaning but herself is like locked in and kind of, it's kind of like a superficial ego that is incapable of having any kind of, of um, deep involvement with the world. And that kind of like, that was so resonant at the time, this was 2004 or so, with, with the, the whole, and with, with Japanese, like with the whole cultural establishment and with the art, with the literature critics, um, and also with, with just the generation, it is just a very interesting piece of, of um, just an example for, for how, what, what was, it's also, right, um, the bio, right, let's say lit, literary, lit, liter, literates who were kind of like diagnosing what we see now, this was already then in, in Japan. This was it's also something we, we should we should I think keep in mind so this whole this whole really this this postmodern virtual space this problem this was also um, um, discussed in Japan already in the in the um, I don't know twenty years ago yes um, earlier earlier than and then that you have Ghost in the Shell and you have all those again those, those dystopian um, um, yep. pieces which also um, have that as an issue. Um, I just, um, yeah, I just want to highlight it, right? Where we need art, right? Um, yes. And especially, right, if, if Japan would, I don't know, just become like, I don't know, China or so, and it's just about productivity, just about work, and you have you've nothing beyond that, then then culture just cannot, they, they, they can, I think that's why, why in Japan it's still, um, there is still a, a like a cultural pool where you see, like okay we, we all watch this those movies and we all know this and then i can right then, then we can talk about something and we can we can maybe share we can share culture we can be cultural um and when when those movies or, or pieces of art can can afford that i, mean, I think that's great um and oh, it's, yeah. it, it's, I hope, I hope, I mean, I don't know how the future will be, but I hope that um, they, they will, this will just continue, right? And, and maybe, maybe at some point we, I mean, that the socioeconomics are really bad because like when you try to find the roots of those problems, you, you go back into that de in the decades and so, and um but at least, at least they have they have a great culture where um, mm. that that can at least provide some meaning. Oh yeah. And I think I think again again our, 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 we can't we can't we can't compare our our um, especially for children our culture. The, I mean, what I see now for children, it's horrible. It, There's it, entertainment. It, they're, they're, I mean, this is another topic, but. Um, there, oh, whatever gets those dopamine releases man you know we you, whatever that tiktok dopamine release or whatever you know you snort it through your nose i'm sorry that's terrible um no well you know a, a bunch of things um you know you mentioned kind of the technology and different things uh so if we're talking about an akira you know japan and some and even the live action some of the it's done had the body horror genre right which is the idea that the technology is becoming part of your body and different things 
That's such a unique genre that only now, really, frankly, in the West, we're talking about the metaverse. We're talking about technology, transhumanism and yeah, different things. That, that, that Akira was produced in 1989 is, is, is mind blowing. I yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. So ahead of its time, just as Ghost in the Shell, right? Crazy. Like, so there's this weird question of why Japan is so radically ahead of the time in like even of the 80s or the 90s. You can get into some of the, the 80s movies we mentioned or different. They're like, why, why, why? Well, I, I think that might too. If we, if we accept this premise that Japan, Japan got into meta-modernity before everyone else, precisely because they absorbed the West without the good, you know, the religion part. So their acceleration into meta-modernity was, um, was not slowed down, where in the West it's actually still catching up. You know, today, a lot of people talking about transhumanism they talk about living forever and you talk you know japanese people live along which is kind of weird because like people's happiness level in the west has gone down and we want to live forever it's kind of weird uh but you know so you have this kind of talk about transhumanism you have this talk about machines and always being online and different things japan was thinking about that in the 90s in the 80s they were already thinking about that because there's something about meta modernity when you don't have religion or you know all these traditional sources of meaning you start looking to the future you start thinking about the future. And sometimes you look to the future in a hopeful way, but you also look toward it in a potentially bad way. Because whenever you're thinking about it, you have to think of all the different um, all the different ways of doing things. And so you have Japan thinking about what it would be to merge with technology really early on and seeing the risks of losing humanity with that and so on and so forth. You have Japan that has also long before the West had any sort of adult animation has, has had that because th that frees up storytelling. There's this sort of fascinating acceleration of those, of those realms that Japan one has thing, been in. Right, one thing I, I just want to mention is because it, it fits, right? Um, you know Nausicaa? Yes. Um, was I think produced in 1984 so. Very early, yeah. And there, there you already had um, kind of like this topic of the destruction of nature. Yep very 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 early i think compared to the west and then you have it like in the right in the ghibli movies like um that kind of like the, the destruction of the environment that is a, a huge thing. theme is this huge thing in, in many of those movies um, oh yeah before again before before this really became like a big and again again there you have an issue that concerns us all the kind of like the alienation of from nature the destruction of, of global warming and so forth but they solve it with art and today in the west because we are so Politics. locked into this, this modernist moral moralistic framework we can only think of kind of like solving it either technologically or we, we think of solving it kind of like moralistically and then we i don't know we go protesting and then hope we, we hope something changes but but like like this kind of this transmutation or transfiguration into like an artwork is i think much more powerful and makes is much more thoughtful and, and makes you really question about the actions that you take than let's say all the, all the things how we are dealing let's say often with the meaning crisis and again we do this in a in a in a predominantly moralistic sense which can there can nothing there's no generation of anything that's that's um, good or helpful or true or beautiful. Um, oh, yeah. Well, so, even you mentioned the Ghibli film. I mean, whether you get in a Princess Mononoke castle, you know, you don't have hard line. So you have a concern about nature, um, which, you know, in America, we may have had a one off like Fern Gully or something like that, or as an animated small kid or dances with wolves, and but really not a con like a continual concentration on the trade offs between uh, urbanization and agriculture. You know, that those kind of trade offs were not, not are not so present. Um, but also, too, in a lot of them, you, you don't have clear lines between good and evil, you know is the quote-unquote there's not really an antagonist in princess mononoke or whatever it's more like forces that are kind of going back and forth and people just look at you know the, the she's looking after the leopards in princess mononoke but she's also trying to build a town to feed people and like today now in the west you know people think something like uh, you know not to bring it up but it's something like game of thrones or whatever where there's not clear good or evil is such an innovation is so new well no those breaking down of the line between good and evil has existed in a lot of the japanese stories for a very long time again all product it seems to me all of these are products of meta modernity that japan has been i don't know because you start to realize that hard ideological lines hard political lines all these different things just get in the way of meaning 
And so you cannot do it, you know, and you, you really can't do it to function as a culture. And you also, um, it gets in the way of good art. Now, of course, the crisis becomes, um, uh, how do you move into metamodernity and not only have art as your source of meaning? Because I think it's quite clear just with the example of the, the high suicide rates in Japan that that's not going to cut it. I actually, frankly, you know, uh, not to, you know, to bring some uh, things together. Oh, before I forget, I also wanted to note it. I sometimes wonder, you know, how uh, with Hegel philosophy, you know, uh, the owl of Nineveh flies at dusk or whatever, you know, the philosophy takes off, right? But, you know, when the world's falling apart or whatever, I wonder actually if all, for me, Japan almost shows that something similar happened with art. Like actually art takes off and gets really good. And at the same time, philosophy does at, at dusk and different things. Um, and, you know, for me, I think Japan is a good case study if we accept the premise, and I frankly, if I, again, if you think of it from a veil of ignorance, I think it's very hard to argue that the music and story, like if you got the script, just the script of Final Fantasy VI, and you didn't know it was a, bit, a, a video game, or you just got the script of freaking Ghost in the Shell, you didn't know it was an animated film, you'd be like, that's amazing. That's like the best thing I've ever read. Uh, just from a veil of ignorance, and the same with the music. That being the case, I think actually Japan goes to show you that a lot of people who are putting their eggs in the basket of we're going to solve the meaning crisis with art uh, may not be the best answer. That may not cut it. it. It's better than not having it. Obviously, I do creative novels and do everything in the arts, and I'm big on the role of art. But art alone may not address all the areas of life, even if it's obviously can address a very large part of it or a very big part of it. Um, it may, Japan might be evidence that you need to do more. Now the question then of course becomes what is more? And you know, I'm big on beauty and I make distinction between art and beauty. There's something about beauty, but then you also have to have true and goodness. So there's this trinity of things that you need where for me, Japan goes to show you that if you have like you, like I just see a lot of people in meta-modernity putting their eggs in the basket of art. You know, that's how we're gonna find meaning again. And it's like, well, yeah, it seems really, really great, but it doesn't seem like it alone can bear the whole, let's put it this way, it can't bear the whole burden. Definitely. Um, I, I think, right, um, I mean, right, Japan had a rich ethical tradition, mm. Confucianism, mm. had a rich um, religious tradition, right, Buddhism, and you, you also have this kind of like nature religion, um, Shinto, which... Infl right when you watch Ghibli movies and you see all those forest spirits and and, yeah. and so then then you see kind of like an, a deep appreciation for nature yeah. um, that is also one of the things that I I have always been extremely attracted because this 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 really this um, um, when you go to a shrine in Japan nothing you, you enter the forest it's really like you enter a different world and it's often when you watch the movies the anime movies it's often right um the shrines are a threshold right and then you are in this this other world this imaginal world i don't know how to call it um where then there are now there are forest spirits and there are there are those those presences right in which of course when you have a reductionistic worldview you can't, of course, believe in kami and tama and so tama souls, right? Um, you can't believe in those things because, right, these are like, I would say they are on the same ontological plane, like angels or so. Sure. And this is also, right, what art affords us, that you can keep those things alive. Yes. And and thus, right, this is also one thing, right, when you have a merely technological approach to, let's say, let's solve global warming, um, then you collapse the whole of nature to, I don't know, CO2 certificate. And, and you, you yeah. instead of, um, I heard this, Mark Vernon in a video made this argument, right? Why don't we think of let's re-enchant nature? Let's, mm. let's discover, let's say, that those, those more presences in, in nature. And I think, right, and again, in Japan, it's, this is still somehow alive. It's very hard to talk with that, but it's still it's still somehow alive. And I've seen this, right? There aren't many holidays in Japan, right? There are just those um, kind of like public holidays, just a few of them. Um, and then usually the whole country rests for a few days. Mm. This is just three times a year. Um, again, for, for like a few days, like five, 
five to seven, eight days or so. Um, and then you, but then you see, okay, those people are, they, they, it's not all about work and you can actually have kind of like leisure with dignity where we then just go into nature and, and um, we, we, we don't, right? We don't do all those surrogate things that we do at our leisure in the West, like, I don't know, binge drinking or like, like those very weird things that now yep. also prevail, right? Or like all those, those, those challenges and in the, in the, everything becomes more absurd in, in the internet because you, right, you try to be more extreme and more original and, and more, I don't know. Um, no, but but like they're, they're just some very nice nice things um, that you that sometimes you can participate in in, in Japan. Um, so maybe going back right to meta modernity, right? You said art alone won't help us, and I think right then this is right. This is Nishitani's criticism was that the Zen communities in Japan they were too detached. For example, he said. Yeah, those Buddhists, right? They don't really pay attention to what's going on on a historical scale. They're just living in, in the like, uh, part, like away from society in their monastery and doing what they always did. Many of them, and but that, but that's not a real, that's not a viable response to let's say the challenges that globalization present to us. Mm. Um, so, so that kind of like right, that, that things like meditation like zen also become more viable for like a large like a large chunk of the population i think that that would would really help and then also right with that also philosophy not not uh, not academic philosophy but like philosophy in the ancient sense is a by the way of life and as as kind of like wisdom practices um if that could also right um be revived again for right. for this time i think that that would also help a lot and then 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 we have the socioeconomic issues mm. um which might be which might be the hardest to address right. Right. um but that's i get that that's i mean we have no record rates of inflation everywhere because right. no, no 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 nothing no, right. nothing is <laughs> right. no, nothing is holy any longer um but go, go oh on. yeah no well you know a, a few things um you know uh the the return to nature being connected with nature that seems to be a necessary part of what we need great art seems to be a necessary part of what we mean the interesting thing is it seems like addressing the meaning crisis i think sometimes our mind goes what is the thing that addresses the meaning crisis but it seems to be that you need a few things like there's a, a few things you need like art closer to nature you need a view of suchness you know connection with suchness as as we've talked about before um you need a connection with community that's important but it's like you need like 10 things or something which critically to say that um i guess the point i was making i wasn't meaning to say that art plays no role in addressing meaning it's that i think a lot of people feel like that that's all you need it's like the one thing you need in the same way that some people feel like fixing nature is the one thing you need well no that's a that's a necessary component but it is not the whole component. I do so much work on beauty and the aesthetics because I feel like that's been so radically ignored, but I never mean to suggest that the aesthetics is all you need. You also have to have, it's always that trinity, beautiful, beauty, truth, and goodness. I think really what it all goes to show is very often when we talk about religion, because obviously the glaring cause of the meaning crisis has been you know, the loss of religion. And often we just think about religion as belief in an all powerful being that you, know, you go after you die and that's where your life gets meaning. I think we really fail to realize that religion was never a single thing. It has always been a multitude of practices. It has been a certain uh, theology. Yes, there has been beliefs, but then there's also been a art that has come out of religion. There has been community that comes out of religion. There has been certain communal practices that come out of religion. Every religion brings with it a certain relationship with the world and therefore nature in different things. It gives you a direction where religion has always been a, a, a toolbox of practices that, and you need all of them. That's the crazy thing. Like whenever religion lost one of those pieces and only had one, then it became fundamentalism or then it became just kind of a uh, humanism with a religious tent or something like that. Like it has to have this whole plethora. And I think the challenge today is kind of, we're almost looking to philosophy or the arts to somehow sustain us 
But actually, we have to we have to think of a multitude of practices that that come together. And and I think and it is not easy to determine what that is when you don't. The advantage of religion is you could open it up. And generally speaking, it would outline if you are a Hindu, these are what you do. You have this belief, you do these, it's a mixture of actions. This is the kind of music you play. This is what you listen to, this multitude of practices. Without religion, it's kind of difficult to determine what your manual is. That's going to bring, is it your, you're an American? Well, what do Americans do? Well, okay, uh, I don't really like hot dogs. I don't like that food. I don't really like country music or different things. So it's like, ah, it's not so much. Um, but it's, it's finding a new, I, I guess what I'm trying to say uh, is that there is, it's like to address the meaning crisis, you need more of a manual than a single thing, I guess, like a toolbox. I, and I think it's just important to get that in our head because for me, Japan shows you that if you do the art stuff unbelievably well, that alone is not going to address the meaning crisis. There's, there's, that's, that's a part of it. That's a necessary part, but there's this toolbox that's needed. I guess that's where, whenever I think about, that's kind of where my mind goes, where the meaning crisis um, which I think is the central concern, a central concern of metamodernity, is um, it's, it's not a single thing. It's not just art or politics or family even. I mean, it's got to be a toolbox or a manual, a book, maybe I'll say a book, a book of life or something uh, that you need to address it. And right then with technology and right, technology disrupts all of this. And kind yes. of like, I think, right, this was early on, this was, artistically intuited by things like Ghost in the Shell or Archie or mm. um, right? Because it, 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 it just disrupts how we, we access the world and, and how we think about the world and how we think about nature. And it, it, it does, right? It alienates us from, from the world and from labor and so forth. Oh, yeah. And right, I mean, when we then talk about economics, right? I think, right? For, for, you also had this, right? Um, this conversation with Johannes, and I think you talked about the measure of sufficiency again. Mm. This gole, right? This this idea, um, and for example, I I would also say, right? I don't know how it is for you, but but right, the, 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 those artworks get you out of this loop where you're just in consumption. To yes. kind of like you know, I have to consume all the time and I have no sufficiency, but then you right, then you 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 consume, you you enjoy, you taste a work of art, and especially those artworks from Japan, right? And then you you I'm 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 I feel sufficient in my being for like days. Yes. <laughs> so sometimes when I watch a great movie, um this it this is also not something right that that costs a lot that's expensive that's right. it's available for everyone yes like like the books right books are uh, go to yes. the library it doesn't cost a lot um it's all there um and you right you don't have to you don't have to say oh i need to buy i don't know a 500 hundred dollar bag or a new car or whatever um to to feel sufficient in myself um that, that that's something that art or meditation um can definitely help us to, to find right and then yeah. right then i mean even even how japanese right? like they 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 eat so healthy i'm i'm often um right they have the lowest rate of obesity in the world um and eating together is something that's practiced even in schools so like you all ate the same thing for lunch you you they even have to prepare their own seats all the time it's very it's very active they really practice this um and they're all very healthy those those meals yeah. and um so that that's for example one thing that's also right we need to get those things also right so that's also right food crisis like like i mean there's so many artificial foods now in the in the west that are so unhealthy right um and Japanese cuisine, for example, is, is regard and it's also, I think, one of the primary reasons why there are so many old people. And so yeah. right, getting localized food, getting, getting regional food, I don't say that, that this is now a big thing. In, it is a thing in Japan for some, but that's also something we, 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 we have to consider. So again, yes. 
just echoing what you said, right? We need to find a lot of, we have to, to solve a lot of issues and build yes. a kind of toolbox to address this kind of like meaning crisis of, of our time. Well, and, 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 you know, again, the Bible has dietary restrictions, the Quran, you know, there are, they, it's fascinating, diet was a part of religion, mm. that was one of the concerns. And it would seem that, I guess, with the meaning, so one, it would seem that we can take from Japan diet, that they, the lessons from diet to solve metamodernity, art, we can take from metamodernity, we need to swallow our pride and understand that animation allows certain stories to be tell, told, and certain musics to be created in response to those new stories that otherwise simply are not possible in live action, and that's great greatly impoverishing if you miss out on that. Um, you know, you, you get those three and then concerns about nature. You know, those are three things that Japan can give us that perhaps it would seem to me that the pressures of industrialization, globalization or different things has kind of brought out in that culture because they've had accelerated metamodernity. So we can learn those lessons from Japan without necessarily having to pay the same price. You know, hopefully nowhere in America will we start having to put nets so that when people jump off, they're caught like they have to do in Japan. So we can take that. So if we take those three things, then the question becomes is like, all right, so those are things we can learn. to show. What are some other things? that we can learn from other places on the world. And that to me would be true pluralism, frankly, you know, truly learning mm. from difference and yeah. diversity, not the, what I sometimes feel is the, dare I say, cheap diversity that you sometimes hear from people that is very um, shallow and political, but that would be kind mm. of a deep diversity where you see this is what's good, you know, and then what are the things that America has that are good? Maybe there are different economic policies that you would want to take from another culture or different things and to bring them together and take sounds very imperialistic. But then once, you know, once people figure out the correct combination, well, then everyone can do it. So it's not imperialistic. It's figuring out a problem so that everyone can benefit as that problem um, is solved. Uh, because I think it's something, you know, there's that kind of seeing what places are doing right to, to figure out the correct toolbox. I think what was, right, I think we have to close the conversation rather soon, um, but right, what, what in, in Japan is so weird, but also enlightening at the same time is there's still a kind of like a coexistence of, of tradition mm. and, and this kind of like accelerating modernity or meta-modernity or mm. post-modernity. Um, and you, you kind of like you can you can you see them both and and it's 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 very funny right because in other places right some some places are literate right they, they just go full on into post modernity or right uh, meta modernity and then there's there's no tradition but in, in Japan at least that there has been maybe also because it's so long again there already um, like since the major restoration in the middle of the nineteenth century. That you have a kind of there is there are those parallel structures still yeah. that the way where tradition is I mean and we have to say like those structures becoming less and less unfortunately um, traditional ways of farming traditional ways sure. of craft crafting and so they, they still exist um, but but maybe the last thing right I, I i listened to a talk by dc schindler before we um mm. like a few hours ago and he, he it was about redeeming book that was the title and he said right that most of the work today is because of its technological nature is it's sophistical it's decontextualized and we've what did you say we cleansed we cleansed out um we we right we we it's it's not about the thing, but it's just about the optimization of everything. Mm. It's it's about optimization of processes, of operations, of how how to make things better. But it's never about the thing in itself, mm. and that kind of like creates then the schism between you and techne, in mm. this kind of like ancient sense, where techne is kind of like the encounter between man, world, and God. Um. And right there, you have a deep immersion with the world in the things you are doing. Um, and that's something also that, that I see this in the animation and I mm. see this in the traditional crafts. Mm. And I see this in meditation, for example, where you're really immersed with yourself, with your body, your soul, and then with your world. And then let's say also the, this, this um, plane of the divine, of the transcendent, of the more, so to say. And 
right? And then you have, right? Then you have, you have, I don't know, Kafkaesque bureaucratic structures. Those exist in Japan. It's really, really extreme. Um, um, there's a there's a good novel if if someone who's listening to this is interested. Um, it's called Sixty Four. Is a is a criminal novel. Is is is, is has been um, has been compared to Kafka's um, to one of the Kafka novels. I think the process, but just bigger. It's it's really it's really a frightening novel. It's re mm. really um, and. Um, and then you have, right, then you have those traditional artwork masters kind of like in the 16th generation or so still producing, I don't know, um, bamboo whisks or, or um, calligraphies or mm. um, tea bowls or, or so. And then right where you see mastery on a level that, that you find almost nowhere in the world. Mm. Um, and again, where there's still this deep immersion with, let's say, with your with your work of art, with with your product, um, but again, that's it's declining, and and um, I hope I hope this survives in the future, and just as I hope anime survives because it's <laughs> it's a great it's a great work. It, it's it's so so great that we we have this, and it's I think we need it because yes. it's a kind of like. It's a, it's it's taking us out of our more realistic, ideolo ideologized, politicized hat that we we have in the West. So, absolutely, absolutely. Well, you you uh, again by the medium not being so restricted by live action, there are certain stories you can tell, and it becomes easier to tell the stories that people need because you are not bound by the, those particular limits. And I, and I will also note that I, I have also seen that emphasis on mastery, rather it be a program, uh, the mastery of learning uh, ballroom dancing or a musical instrument or all the like gardening, there's like this real emphasis on there is value in mastering something. And I think, again, that's another response to meta-modernity. As you've lost me, you're looking for you know, a meaning. And I think that's another lesson you can take from Japan, that there's real value in mastering um, something. Well, Mrs. Aruba, this has been delightful. I've really appreciated this conversation very much. Uh, and thank you so much for your time. For your time. I, look, I certainly will be asking for another discussion in the future. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for this very enlivening conversation. <laughs> I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it. Thank you, Mrs. Aruba.